Hi everybody, it's Alana from Treehouse. I am here again this week with the return of Daniel DQ Qualiotzi. Daniel, welcome. Hello. It's DQ How are you? Revenge. Yeah, well, this is like, <laughs> it's more than revenge now. This is like the third time you've been here because everyone has so many questions for you and asks us uh, more stuff for next time. So thanks for joining us again. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. I keep turning up like a bad penny. I hear you're a crazy cat lady these days. <laughs> I'm trying to represent. <laughs> I, I really Anyone prefer... can be a crazy cat lady. That's Come true. I, I prefer eccentric cat woman when people start uh, picking cat titles. Possessive. Cat possessive. Cat, I like that. Cat possessive. Yeah, I do. I mean, I don't really possess cats so much as I allow them to float around my home <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and do what they will. Yeah. So it's part of the beauty of this relationship with our with our cats is like you let them in, now all bets are off. Like <laughs> surrender. They like little gremlins. <laughs> Sometimes they're the good gremlins. That's they're why always... they don't want to get wet. Yeah, yeah, because they don't want to multiply. Because they, <laughs> they just they like their little houses the way they are. <laughs> No, they're good gremlins. My, I was, <laughs> my, my, one of my little gremlins today, I was eating a buttered toast and she appeared from under the table and then hands came up and <laughs> hugged my toast <laughs> into her face. And I was like, you little imp. <laughs> um, so today we were going to be talking about, I know we had a request last week um, that we talk about one, cats for people who are new to, I hate to say cat ownership, but having cats. And number two, um, how to live with cats for people who may have allergies, um, because this is something that I know a lot of people want to be able to do. And you know, that's one of the common things that I can't adopt, I have allergies. And I know that there, there's a spectrum of them, so we can we can talk about that or start with whatever you like to talk about. Mm, um, well, Let's talk about the allergic person first, then we'll talk about the person who is new to the relationship. Okay. Um, I think, oh boy, allergies. So like, I'm not, not an, an expert on how to keep yourself from being allergic. That's, uh, that's not the conversation we're having here. But I do think that um, folks who do have allergies to cats are present a, uh, which, how should I say, a very um, intriguing offer to some cats. And what I mean by that is that if you're a regular person without cat allergies, you often are, um, well, as a human being, you do impulsive things sometimes. You see a cat sitting, just minding their own business, but oh gosh darn, are they cute right now? You know, and like, my, I'm fooled myself. I'm an expert, but I'm fooled by the Venus flytrap that is my cat. And, you know, he's laying on his back and he's all, his belly is showed, showing to me and I want to lean over and put my hand right in that soft little trap right there. Um, but, but I don't, I pull back on that. But, uh, but most- I don't, people, <laughs> I put my face in it. <laughs> you know, every once in a while you find yourself like, okay, that's my fault, right? But <laughs> the average person takes liberties. They take a lot of liberties with their animals and by liberties, I mean, they're doing things that may not be consensual and uh, cats are, are from the second you walk into the door as a new person to them, they're going to be sizing up your intentions. They're going to be trying to figure out, okay, like, what does this person want from me? Are they going to get in my space? Um, and I, a lot of times I will describe cats as an animal sealed with a bubble and some cats just, they don't want that bubble popped at all. You know, they just want space to be in their bubble. And when you're allergic to a cat, the cat in the bubble is like, oh, that, that human being is not going to pop my bubble. I can get my bubble close to this human being if I want to. And they're not taking those liberties. They're, I, I actually don't have to worry about their intentions at all. So you're almost, you know, in the cat human relationship, you're, uh, you're, you're scoring more points even though you don't want to score them because as an allergic person, 
you don't want the cat getting on your lap. You don't want the cat hair on you. You can't really touch them. You've got to worry about touching your face, right? So this COVID training is really good training for you because number one, if you're washing your hands a lot, that's going to help. Um, but also touching cats, uh, if you relent on that, you're likely to get a little bit more back from them in uh, the form of social bonding. Like when they come and rub up on you and when they give you those pheromones from their cheeks and their sides that are positive, um, you're, you're allowing them to make the first impression, to come over and say, hi, I'm fluffy, nice to meet you, and they rub up on you. So if you're allergic, you, you, you actually, you, bon you get the bonus from that because you're, you're, you're doing a lot less, you're gonna get, gonna get more back. Whereas the person who is like, oh, let me get my hands on this cat, they're like, whoa, 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 right? Give me some space. Let me figure out what this negotiation is going to be. So, um, a, you know, as an allergic person, you're going to want to play with your cat. So physical hand play is obviously going to be bad for you and bad for them at the same time. So I've got toys sitting next to me that we're going to talk about. All kinds of toys that give you long poles and distances from cats. Um, so... If you can create a world for your cat where they can make choices to just be around you and ma they're making the decision to be with you, that's always that's always going to benefit you. So my advice to people who are non-allergic, act like you're allergic. <laughs> so you're saying I should not put my face in my cat's belly. No, huffing cats uh, is probably not going to be beneficial <laughs> to you or them in the I, long run. I have one cat. I think he likes it. <laughs> Cause he, well, I mean, he invites me, he, he goes like this and then he like does this thing and you just, it's really hard to resist. And when you put your face in it, he just, he, he's okay with it. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is what gets us every time because sometimes they're okay with it. Right. They're situational, <laughs> you know, things are situational. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes, they're they're not. sometimes they're in the mood. Sometimes they're not. Pretend like they're never going to be in the mood and you're probably going to have a good interaction every single time. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's my piece on allergies. I just, I th I've, I've spoken to a number of folks who have allergies and they're like, I don't know what it is, but cats love me. I'm like, they love you because you're not making eye contact. You're not staring them down. They don't have to worry about you. They can have ownership over you in the moment, in the meow, live in the meow, they're doing it with you in that moment. Whereas we are like, you know, after a while they figure out all of our moves. So it's really like dating. <laughs> you don't want to show too much interest and then the cat will be really yeah. into it. Just be a little coy. Don't put all your all your cards on the deck, you know. You should do the rules for cat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm finding a lot of parallels between, I mean, honestly, like, the word I, I use a lot because it's a really powerful word is consent. It, it is about consent with, with all animals, really, not just cats, human beings, horses, dogs, chickens, raccoons, whatever it is. Like they, they want to feed, they want to make the choice to be around you most of the time. Right. So um, if we're doing things with our hands that are physical to another creature, and they're like, I'm not so sure. And their body language shows you that they're kind of like recoiling from that. Stop doing that. Right. Yes. So, and I guess, I guess one question too is like, and we're, I mean, we're obviously not medical doctors or anything, but like, do you find a lot of people that have allergies that are living with cats? Because I find a lot that that's a very common thing for people to say is I want to adopt, but I can't. And I know there's a full spectrum of allergies and some people really can't be around them and some can't, but yeah. like, what do you see a lot of people that are, are trying to make it work? I see folks that aren't like, I'm allergic and I've never had a cat and want to get one. What I see more of is I, I have cats. I'm fine, but my boyfriend moved in and that person is allergic. So now we have to make this work and we have to live together. So, I mean, you know, folks buy air purifiers and they work real hard with their nasal sprays, whatever that they have to do to, to meet them halfway. But also they're a lot more fastidious about cleaning and vacuuming and wiping down counters and 
you know, keeping their litter boxes clean and stuff. Some people have allergies to dust and cat litter. Cats have allergies to cat litter. So, you know, it's not like I'm finding people who are like, oh, gosh, I can't have a cat. I'm finding people who are like, I moved in with this chick and now I'm suffering <laughs> and this cat loves me. What do I do? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could date someone who wasn't like, no, I totally on board with my cat. I mean, I have so yeah. many. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I don't have that out. many, but I have enough that it would make it a challenge. Swipe left on that one. <laughs> so is it is it a right swipe? Right swipe on my cats. My cat, my cat, my cat, my cat. <laughs> I've also often said there should be a dating app for cat people. And I would name it Katinder. Katinder. Yes. And do you put up pictures of your cats and see who swiped right on your cat? Is that how you get the match? It's like an equal. It's you and your cats at the same time. So people can be like, oh, I like him. And, you know, it's like dual profiles. You're, of course, writing the profile for your cat and you. But you're matching both because you might end up living together. So what if your cat and those cats have them co-joined? I'd, really like, I'd like it if they had to call you. <laughs> I'd like it if they had to swipe through the cats first. And then if they like... <laughs> Swipe oh yeah right on you all my cats then they get to see me yeah you, you swipe the cats but then the human part is blind that's a good game show mm. i think we've just come up with something i think we should figure that out yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay so i think hopefully that answers the questions about um that so um, we have a question that came in in the middle here from Vanessa. Hi, Vanessa. I've met you before. She's very nice and supportive of Treehouse. Um, she says, a question about getting our Treehouse kitty used to our two dogs. He hisses at them, but seems very curious about them. All right. Yeah. Um, so cats and dogs living together, uh, a lot of the emphasis, a lot of our, of our energy and management goes in the dog direction because again i just described the cat with a bubble around them right dogs pop bubbles dogs make impulsive quick decisions and often not not smart ones i mean i love dogs but god you know sometimes they just they really make the wrong move with cats so i'm right now living with a cat and a dog my cat cubby and we have a Westy, little West Highland Terrier. Uh, and they are now together eight years in this house and have learned how to navigate around each other. Now the saving grace here is that my, the dog in the house is fearfully respectful. Of, he's not making any gestures. He's not coming over to smell my cat. He's not trying to jump on the couch when the cat is there. He simply just wants to navigate around my cat and get to where he wants to go. But if Cubby is there in the middle of a doorway, he's like, F this, I'm not going around this cat. Why would I, you know, <laughs> I'm just gonna sit here. So that's like, that's like the perfect situation in my, in my opinion, where you have a cat who's like in command, but isn't in command with aggression. It's just in command with body language and posturing. So Cubby, I call him the traffic cop. He just sits there and he watches. If you have a dog who is a little bit more actionable, barky, approaching, you know, a little, you know, frenetic in energy, then a cat is going to be like, whoa, 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 too much. And there's going to be hissing, growling, swatting, that kind of stuff. So what do you do? Um, you know, dogs are a lot more obedient. They do follow directions. So like going in the direction of getting an obedience trainer for your dog, working on recall. Does your dog stop, come when called and, you know, revere you highly enough to be like, oh, screw that cat. Let's do this now. That's very important to, to be able to redirect them into something a little bit more uh, uh, cathartic, right? Um, baby gates or X pens or anything that you can do that creates a soft barrier so the dog can be managed and the cat can just be around that barrier uh, and feel as if they they still have safety, free will, and command of the room. So you yeah. want vertical territory for that cat, for sure. I was going to say, I think Vanessa's dogs, I've seen pictures, and she just also commented here, are rather large. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it. So one of them is a 95-pound pit bull. 
um, who I've seen is is very friendly and wants to be friends. And then Alma, I think she's also pretty big. Um, so she says she's more dominant, but doesn't really care. Do you feel like the size of the dog has anything to do with how the cats react? I mean, react? it all, it, it's a, it's, I don't always trip on size of animals because I've seen some really small cats own huge cats and, and dogs just, you know, with their bravado. Um, but, but I, I think in this case, like what we want is for your cat to be feel safe, maybe up above and where they have the command to be like, if I want to leave, I can. And then this 95 pound pit bull who actually wants to be friends can be leashed and held at a distance. We just don't want them to come together where, where there is a lack of control. So it's easier to control a dog than it is a cat. We just want to allow this cat to feel as if like, okay, when Meatball is in the room, I still feel free. And oh, by the way, maybe I get my favorite treats before, during, and after this ordeal. So I'm more willing to tolerate it in the future. We want these get-togethers to end positively. We don't want it to end with a swap or a hiss where we go, oh, 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 and then we move this cat out of the room and it's a whole event. We want Meatball to walk up, cat gets a treat, Meatball leaves the room. We don't want him spending too much time so the cat's impression is like, okay, this is like a slow boiling pot of water here. You know, we want we want them to, to feel in command all the time. So um, that's where cat trees and shelving and going up one way and coming down another, a very circular way of navigating allows the cat never to feel trapped and to feel like, you know what? Piss off meatball. I don't need to be in the room with you right now. You know, and then they they jet. So escape rats are important. Yeah. And then keeping the dog leashed and kind of handled so that the cat can get in, get yeah. out. Leashed. And of course, you know, like I said, the training is really important. Sometimes if you can baby gate or pen them in, that works. But dogs tend to be really like eager to get to the edge of a gate or over a gate. And that energy is going to make a cat just either freeze up or, you know. So she has a good follow-up question. What about putting the cat in a crate to get used to the dog? Is that the opposite of what you want to do? Yes, that's the opposite of what we want to do. That puts a cat in a situation where they have no control, where they feel as if they're restrained and they, they're trapped. And then there's like a shark circling around the boat. You know, like it's not, it's not going to make them feel more secure. It just keeps that animal controlled. So uh, I've heard that a lot from a lot of different cat uh, guardians where they try that move and it, it doesn't work well. Um, like I said, you want this cat to be able to walk into a room or, or any room they normally go into and still feel like they are in pole position. And that's no matter how you slice it, if the cat is not in control, it's going to go bad. That makes sense. So no cages, leave the cat in control, keep the dog controlled. My dog, I, I love that my dog is so good with cats that like when the cats get into it, she's the enforcer that breaks it up, which cracks yeah. me up. Yeah. Like she'll bark and she'll step in between them. She's like the wind. She gets in between and they go their separate ways. And like, I don't know what I'm going to do in life when she's not here because she's so good with cats. Like, I've brought her to people's houses and I've watched her and she gets down like this and then she just stays really still and hopes that the cats come to her and then she'll just very slowly <laughs> do She's, her thing. You know, a conflict resolution isn't just a human trait, you know? I'm sure it, it, it's, it exists in animal kingdoms, multi-species, you know, from species to species. And I don't know, maybe that cat was a lawyer and a, a dog was a lawyer in a past life or something, I don't know. She's, she's like a cat whisperer. She's over here sleeping, but she's a referee or something. She's fantastic. She's, she's like the cat, the, the cat dog of dog. I don't even know what to say, <laughs> but it makes me happy. So a dog cat ambassador. Yes, exactly. Um, Vanessa says, thank you. She will invest in some baby gates. You're welcome, Vanessa. Thank you for your yeah, question. Sure. Um, we have another question as a follow-up from Susan. How would you handle a situation where the cat is aggressing, I guess, aggressive towards the dog? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think in that case, too, like the baby gate is handy because you may want to double stack it so the cat can't scale it. Uh, but it, 
it's always harder when the cat has a has a, a hardwired opinion right from the get go, and that could be there could be two motivations there. It could have a fear based reaction where this cat is threatened by the dog, or is using uh, status aggression, which is like a fancy word for saying I want to be uh, I want to be the top in this house. I want to be the one who is the the boss of all situations, and I'm using aggression to get what I want. So. Um, it, it, I think we have to we have to work really slower than we when we than we choose to in these cases. We often bring animals together in, in in situations where right from the start there's reactivity, hissing and growling, and we hope somewhere you know that it will settle. But if from the from the onset of this these dog and cat come together, there's aggression, then you want to uh, really baby step your way through, you know, using some kind of positive reinforcement or benefit, food, distraction, toys, whatever you can do to allow this cat to just, to, to not feel as focused. Um, and it really all depends on the cat and that level of reacti re reactivity. Some, I've mentioned food puzzles in the past on some of these uh, chats that we do, and food puzzles are, are a good way for a cat to put their brain and their attention into something that they want to do in the presence of an animal they may not actually be crazy about. But if that's a dog who's like, gee whiz, I'm not trying to cause a trouble here, just, you know, in the room, then then we do flip our attention to this cat instead of the dog. Mm -hmm. Sorry, this light is in my eyes and my eyes are like, I'm going to turn this down slightly. I thought you guys would want to see me a little bit better and I think I... <laughs> too well there we go um yeah and it takes time too right like i think that like when my two cats first met my dog they flipped out and i think i want to say it took like three to four months for them to really be comfortable yeah. with her. and even as good as she is like i just let them run do their thing up high watch her and always just kept her controlled and you know if they told her to back away she backed away but it did take yeah. some time yeah, I mean, it, it could take a lifetime. It could be, it could be the, the dynamic they always have. And one of the things I believe highly in as a cat consultant is being blunt, straight, and just you know, brass tacks about certain relationships with cats and cat, cats, cats and dogs. And I will tell you, this is as good as it's going to get. Like, there is no miracle. You can't sprinkle fairy dust on this situation. It's going to be some with something that you're managing based on. A, these animals and who they are, who they always will be, and B, what your actual environment looks like. Is it conducive to them being friends or does it bottleneck them in situations where tension doesn't actually have to arise? Or are we, the human being, putting them in situations that actually aren't conducive to them getting along? And that's that, that tributes to what you're just saying, which is in rushing it, we will create situations for animals to come together and we don't do it always with the presence of mind of doing it really, really slow and chipping away at, at uh, their impression of each other over time. So um, you know, I mentioned my cat and, and um, Nietzsche, the dog here, they do get along, but like if, if Nietzsche rounds a corner and just like blindly walks into Cubby, Cubby's gonna give him a hiss. But that's just Cubby, it's almost involuntary. It's not like he's, you know, he's not in control of it. It'd be like somebody hit your car with their car. You'd be like, hey, you idiot. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> it's a reaction. But it doesn't manifest and then uh, repeat itself and then escalate. And he doesn't stay escalated. It resets if he has the space to reset. That's fair. I mean, it's, yeah. it's like people. You can't just shove a bunch of roommates into a house and be like, hug. <laughs> well, we, we did it here. There's five of us in here. And you, uh, yeah, but, but were you hugging from day one? No, no, <laughs> no, we have plenty of space. Yeah, so I think animals are the same. You have to give them time, right? Yeah. And build their relationships. I mean, I, I recently, my one cat had dental surgery and the other cat I was telling you about this didn't recognize him. They were the best of friends. They were from the same colony. They absolutely loved each other. He went back to trying to love her and she's like, who the heck are you? Like, and now I think it's been almost two months since his surgery. Yeah. And just the other night, finally, I was asleep 
and I felt two cats on my chest, one on each side, and he was licking her because she was sleeping. And I reached up and her entire head was wet because he drools now without his canines. And <laughs> and then I heard her be like, okay, that's enough. And then he walked away. So like, they're yeah. working out. Yeah, that's a big one. Uh, Non-recognition aggression is a problem that a lot of folks deal with because they have to bring their cat to a vet for an emergency or something that they didn't plan. Uh, and they come back smelling different and or looking different. Maybe a paw shaved or the head, you know, there's a baboon cut or something. Uh, and then you have cats that were friends fighting for months. And uh, that too is a, is a very slow reintroduction process that requires, uh, requires us not to feel so hurt by the situation. I think that's what makes it worse. It and was we're so, I felt terrible. We're so sad that our friends aren't friends anymore. Yeah, I took it personally. I was like, wow, what are you guys doing? And I was so upset. And I was upset at her. And I felt bad for him. And... Yeah. <sighs> it breaks your heart. But heartbreak is uh, often repaired in time. So. That's true. That is true. Um, well, we don't have any other questions at this point. So the other thing we were going to talk about was um, cats for newbies. newbies. Yeah. Yeah. How, do we, how do we want to title that? Cats, cats for newbies. Uh, we'll call it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I mean, I, I call it you know being new to the to the to the relationship because it isn't one that is intuitive from the very beginning with some folks. Um, you know, my story with cats, it, it wasn't like oh, I like have had cats since I was five. I waited until I was a young adult in like mid twenties. I moved out here to California and I, I met some cats that were in my yard. And what intrigued me was that they were a puzzle to solve. It was a puzzle of trust that I had to solve. How do I get this creature who has is keeping a wide berth from me and is not so, you know, doesn't trust me. How do I get them to get closer to me so that I can actually like pet them or give them, give them some food? And little by little, I figured that out. And I fell in love with this gorgeous black cat, huge black cat named Dante. And uh, it started this intrigue in me about cats. And that's what got me into volunteering at the San Francisco SPCA. So, you know, if you're a person who's like, gosh, I want to I want to dive in. I think this is for me. Um, one thing to consider is, one, how patient are you? Two, are you willing to to work with this puzzle of trust and consent and see if, if you can uh, get what, what you want out of this relationship. And what, what do we want is the question, I think. Like, we're looking for that unconditional love relationship that people tell us pets give us. But I think the thing to consider as a newbie is that it, the cat-human relationship is stacked with conditions. There are so many conditions and you have to be able to surrender yourself to those conditions so that you're able to keep a balanced life with this animal. So, you know, when we first started the conversation, we we're talking about, well, once you let these cats in your house, you're screwed. It's <laughs> kind of true. I mean, they're like vampires. So, yeah. So, you know, the thing that I find that just boggles people is that they, they want to control the situation. They want, they don't, they, they, what they consider misbehaviors are often not actually that abnormal. They are a cat's react, reaction to living with a person's set of standards and rules that they want in their home. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're not always willing to bend. So if you're new to the cat world, I want you to think about sharing your environment that your environment is not actually all yours anymore that when you allow cats into your home they start looking at the place like it is 100 percent theirs and you are a servant in that environment to their needs will you get love yes you will get love but you have to work in these parameters that i'm speaking of which is really allowing the cats to feel as if they have choices in their in your home like where can i go 
where can I be that I feel safe? Where can I sit in the sun? Where can I use a litter box that, you know, meets my actual preferences? And this is, this is the experimentation it takes to be a cat guardian, is learning all the small idiosyncrasies of your cat and then trying to uh, adapt your environment that you're comfortable with to their needs. So, you know, you're going to want to have cat stuff and you're not going to want to be resistant to that because that's really where I find the rubber hits the road with a lot of folks and their cat problems is that they want, they don't want litter boxes or that type of litter box, or they don't want, you know, the cat furniture. They don't want to look like a crazy cat lady. They want to be, uh, you know, cool and covert about having cats. That's just not going to work out. So you have to be able to bend and you have to be able to, uh, be okay with the fact that every time you put a glass of water on your desk, your cat drinks out of it and that he only drinks out of a glass. And now you have to have glasses of water all over your house. <laughs> Some, maybe, this, maybe this one is not the right temperature, but one of them is. And these are the things we do, you know, we adapt to what they need, but we also respect their need for privacy Physical distance, we're learning as human beings now what it, what physical distancing means. Cats are professionals at physical distance. So there's a lot to learn right now in this situation in, in being trapped in a box with their cats. And if you're new to this and want to, and are thinking about doing it, you're trapped in a box with your cat. So I hope you're, you hope you're adaptable. I, I, the other day I asked a friend how he was doing. <laughs> We sort of got into a conversation, and um, his cat, uh, he's one of my best friends, his cat is a cat that I fostered a few years ago that he ended up adopting, and I remember one day he came home and he sent me a picture, and she had just destroyed his living room because she wanted to jump on the shelves. She pulled down an entire shelf. The shelf took out another shelf. That took out his photography equipment. The stuff was everywhere, and he didn't even really get that mad because he's just like a very calm person, and I was like laughing at this. So the other day, he sends me a picture of his dinner, which was a piece of pizza. And I said, why is it on a, um, a foam plate? I'm like crying, I'm laughing at it. He says, why is it on a foam plate? And he goes, Gidget broke my last plate. <laughs> and I said, what happened to all your other plates? He goes, she got those too. <laughs> so now yeah. he's trapped in his home with no plates. <laughs> and even if he gets more, apparently she just knocks them all on the floor and he's just living with it. <laughs> Like, I, 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 I only eat my meals over the sink now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, and even worse if you have a cat who's vocal. I, that's a lot of a lot of the complaints and calls that I get are from people who are like, "Oh my god, my cat won't shut up. He's meowing all the time." And he want, you know, and even now, like it's it's way worse now in in quarantine. Um, I'm posting videos on Instagram constantly of my cat barking orders at me. <laughs> yeah, they're getting uh, they're getting used to the whole your home all the time. So yeah. on the topic of you know you want to be kind of flexible. Your cat sees the house as their house. They want to go where they want to go. So we got another question here. Hi Sarah. Sarah has a kitty from Treehouse, and uh, she said, "Any suggestions for training a cat to stay out of a baby crib? We have a few months and are considering using a carpet runner with the spiky side up, but we feel bad about that." Mm, yeah, um, that's a hard one because baby rooms are notorious for cat intrigue. You don't want them in there. You're going to be closing that door. There's going to be noise in the room. Your attention is focused in a room where they're not allowed, right? So um, if you are allowing them in, but you don't want them to go into the crib. The crib is like, that's the world's perfect cat bed. It's this nice, small contained box they dip down into. So I think, I mean, the carpet runner is not a bad idea. It's, if, if your spikes are really short, they're not going to hurt the cat. It's just an uncomfortable place to be. Then hopefully what you're doing is imprinting an uncomfortable, uh, I don't know. Just you know, they're they're every time they jump in the crib, they're gonna be like, "Oh, I can't stay here." Okay, and leave. But then you're gonna have a baby in there, and that won't be a carpet runner. That will be actually more intriguing, to, and the curiosity may peak. So, 
I, there are aversives you can buy. I don't love them. I, I, I mean, the, like the only one that I think that sometimes helps is one called a scat can. It's like a can with a motion sensor that will blast air. But Same. then we're frightening your cat. We're, we're, we're making a cat, you know, shoot out of that baby crib and maybe run down the hall. And I don't want her to cause even more stress. So and we don't um, we don't want the cat to to make that correspond to the baby, right? Like you don't want the cat to be thinking every time the baby's around, I get shot in the face with air. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, the the better way to do this is to create a positive experience in the room in another location. So maybe there's a maybe you have a cat tree that's even higher than the than the clicker training them to on top of that cat tree, every time they run up, they get a treat. And we start to reinforce an area within the room that is has benefit to it. There's a benefit to being in here. You're not gonna get, a, a, a you know, you're not gonna be standing on a carpet runner. You're gonna be in a nice place where you wanna be, but you're, asked, you're getting rewards for being there. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you cut out a little bit there. I'm sorry. Oh. When when you were saying you said um, the cat tree would be higher than the crib to give them a better place. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're putting cat furniture in a room and it's the same height as all the furniture in the room, you're not really adding value. So, if we're trying to reverse intrigue in a space where we don't want to create an aversive experience, we don't want the baby association to be negative then a really tall, taller cat tree or shelving unit in that area allows the cat to go to a place where you will be giving them benefits, treats, playtime, affection, good boy, every time you go up there. So that we're trying to, we're trying to steer him into a place where he wants to be without the muss and the fuss of where the baby is. But you are going to be fighting against curiosity that is really hard to dial back. So um, if you have the time in a few months to, to start training in that room, um, that would be the way I would go. It's a good suggestion. And yeah, she said that she was also concerned about doing it as stress-free as possible because um, she doesn't want to transfer negative feelings to the baby. Yeah, so, yeah. Like a nice idea, give them, give them a nice place in the room, something better than the baby. <laughs> babies are, and I am no expert on babies or childcare or anything like that. But one thing I do know about babies is when they when they enter a home with cats that have are not suspecting, it's like dropping a pheromone bomb in your house. They're going to notice that there's new smells, a new human, a new focus of attention that is with you all the time. And um, the thing to consider is that that intrigue that they have may come off poorly at first. They may be a little excited. So being aware of the energy that you actually contribute to that is important. In, in other words, if you're sitting there with your infant and you're, you know, you're, you're doing this, I don't know. You're Come like, I don't know what you do with the baby. Yeah, you do that, baby. <laughs> I don't know. You're sitting there and, the, and the, your cat jumps on the couch next to you. You know, you don't want to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, like all of that makes a cat. Ah, what's what is going on? You want to dial it down, be relaxed, and and allow the cat to you know smell and do stuff. If you need to stand up, stand up. But maybe your partner is there to redirect the cat's attention without it being dramatic. And, and so, you know, this is a it, energy is important. Energy is symbiotic in a house. All of you are feeding off the same energy. So. Your cats respond to your reactions. They respond to your, uh, you know, whatever it is you're doing in displeasure of them. But the, the thing is, they don't care. They don't care that you're upset. So that's not going to work. You know, you're yelling or your reactions aren't going to make the cat go, oh, my bad. You know what? Let me be nice. But they are going to respond to reward. They are going to respond to an energy that does not make them, uh, uh, you know, does it, it doesn't frustrate them, I guess is what I'm saying. So, so it's almost like you don't want to sneak the baby in, but you don't want to have any crazy yeah. reactions about it. It's like the baby is normal. 
We love mm -hmm. you. We love the baby. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Just make make the house even happier of a place now that the baby's here for the cat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you were to add a cat, your cat would immediately be concerned about competition, right? And this is a this is a a baby doesn't offer any eye contact or body language or anything. They basically just cry and are cared for, right? So um, they they aren't as active, but then suddenly they are. Suddenly they're toddlering around your house on their, you know, running around and they're grabby and they're, and they're crying and they do a lot of things that are unpredictable. That you're working your way up to that with an infant, right? So you want to have situations that are not dramatic, not protective, so that your cat is growing up aligned with this child. And then you want to step up that management because at that point you can't just leave your child and the cat to their own devices. You have to have a plan where the cat, again, the bubble, we don't want to pop it. Where's he going to go when this child is running around the room? Can he go up to a cat tree? Can he leave the room? Is he going to get cornered somewhere under a table? You know, these are the things we want to consider. Great. And Sarah said, uh, thank you. She loves the cat tree clicker idea. So thank you very much. Um, thanks for the question, Sarah. Um, we have Anne. She's asking, besides a litter box and food bowl, what do you suggest a new human companion have on hand for their new cat? I think we touched on this a little bit in our last yeah. um, chat, but do you want to do a quick review? Sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, the first thing to consider, we're talking about cat trees and we're talking about furniture. Does your cat have stuff? in the environment that you share with them. A lot of living rooms I go into are couches and, and you know coffee tables and shelves that are high, but they're not for the cat. So every time the cat has to go to a place, they have to share the spot with you. And so we wanna make sure that we're paying, play, we're paying tribute to their, uh, their needs. If it's a shy cat, we want places where they can hide and feel hidden, but not feel buried. Uh, we want cats that feel confident to have places to go up above. We want to think about vantage points. Every time a cat enters a room, they want to know who's coming in now. Where can I go when the energy changes? So cat furniture, very important. Scratching places are also very important. And people really skimp on the scratching posts. Or they buy scratching posts that are too short. There are so many carpeted scratching posts on the market that are about a foot tall and that is not for an adult cat that is for a little kitten so you want a scratching post that is really wide wide enough for them to scratch but also really tall um and maybe that's you know that's waist high or higher um scratch pads you the cardboard cheap ones that you can buy put them all over your house i have them on thresholds so when when a cat enters a room, the first thing they're looking for is like, where's my first place where I can mark it as mine? So if you've got a scratch pad or a scratch post right on a, on a, a, a border, like a, a door or, or a sill, they're more likely to scratch there. I have mine right by my door because that's where Cubby, when I will come home, well, when I used to come home, Cubby would then be like, hi, and then go over there and scratch, but not come over to me. He would go over to the other side of the room. Do you fake coming home for him now? <laughs> yeah. Do you ever just go, go out yard. and just pretend? <laughs> when I go on my uh, government sanctioned walk around the neighborhood and I come back, maybe I'll get a greeting. But so scratch pads are important. Uh, just places where they can mark, especially if you have multiple cats. Um, they each need a place to cathartically scratch. Um, cat toys are very important. If you're just buying toys that you throw around and your cat plays with them by themselves, those are going to lose their steam after a while. And if they're laying around the house and you haven't hid them and reset them and brought them out again, then you've got a graveyard of dead toys laying around your house that your cat is just like, eh, killed that one three days ago. So, so, wait, wait. so they yeah. think they killed it and they just don't want to go back to it because it's done? You know, I don't have scientific proof on that, but... <laughs> I do, I do think that, you know, boredom ensues when toys are not refreshed. Uh, I have a few of them. Actually, here's one right here. It's been sitting here for three days. Cubby's not interested. But if I take it away, maybe I put it in this tunnel 
or up on a high shelf. And he's like, whoa, how'd that get up there? And then it's a new challenge, right? Um, I also use toys that look like real things. This is a, a Neko fly toy. It's a little caterpillar. So, you know, runs around through the carpet, squiggles around, it's gross. But it's on a, on a string that is six foot long, on a nice long pole, right? Did so, this telescope out? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See that? And then, yeah. It, it actually, cool. Easier storage. Easy for storage. But this gives me the space to make something move with a realistic movement because people are terrible at playing with cats do things like this is this is what people do real fast you know like round the round circles there great if you're bringing the toy to your cat your cat is sitting still and you're like here you're bringing the toy to them that your cat is like what is going on like why is this mouse toy running to me that makes no sense so <laughs> Or if you are sitting on a couch and you have not gotten up, but you're just sitting there with your laser pointer or maybe one of these, but you, that's going to be very predictable after about five minutes. All of your moods, moves are going to be predictable. So the cat is going to stop. You get up and you move that toy around the edges of your room, maybe around the edge of the carpet, under your carpet, between some pillows. Then you're playing the game of now you see me, now you don't. So you have a cat who is on the hunt, looking to catch something, pretend to kill it, right? So you've got some realism going on. If you match that with a toy that looks like a thing, like a bug, it moves like a bug, and then you're, then you're, then you're cooking with gas. I think um, most people don't have the time, they tell me, to play with their cats. Now you have plenty. Uh, Oh. Uh oh, you froze there a little bit. Is it just me? Am I the only one seeing you freezing? Nope, can't hear you. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. Daniel. Hmm. Does anybody else see him freeze? I'm back. Oh, there, there you are. You're back. Yay! I was about to start <laughs> dancing. Okay. Okay. Right. Again, so we lost you around um, ten seconds ago. <laughs> We're talking about toys and people who play badly with toys. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the putting yeah. the, now you see me, now you don't. So, so you want to play now? You basically want the toy to evade the cat. You want it to run from them, but you want it to, like if you if you took a mouse and you released it in your living room right now, it's not going to sit in the middle of the room, and it's not going to jump on top of your couch. It's going to run the corner or the wall and then try to hide and evade. So try this at home. Take your toy, let your cat get a bead on it, bring it to a corner, and then round that corner. The second you round that corner, the cat, whoa, FOMO, where's that, where's that toy going? And then they launch. So you want to sustain the launch as much as you can, but you also want the catharsis of actually catching the toy and playing with it. So um, all that is very, very important. And, and most folks, they just, they tell me they don't have the time to do it. The point I was about to make is that if you can think of playing with your cat, I'm gonna get a little woo woo here on you, but if you can think about playing with your cat as meditation, then you're taking the time for you and them at the same time. What would it be like to be a caterpillar for 30 minutes? What would a caterpillar do? You can I like pull it. yourself, right? Pull yourself <laughs> out of who you are. Don't be the avatar. Be the caterpillar. Jump into this for 30 minutes. Give your cat the release and then wipe yourself clean of all your stress. I like that idea. I'm going to be a caterpillar leader. <laughs> <laughs> My cats might not even be involved at all. It's just going to be me. <laughs> be a caterpillar, be a bird. Whatever you relate to, you can be that thing and then let your cat kill you. <laughs> I'm going to be all of it, but yeah, I don't know about that last part. <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying. It's No, it's a good idea. I like it. I like yeah. it. I think that's really fun. I think that's a good thing for people to uh, consider, too. And I, I appreciate the idea of kind of making it a meditation. It's time for you and time for your cat. And uh, yeah. some yeah. playtime. People need to play more. 
cat, you know, your cats are, are killing it at meditation all day long, just sitting there stoically. Yeah. Bread loafing in the moment, in the meow. Right. So how do we get there? We get there by balancing out our lives with them, but also respecting what it is to be a cat. Right. Yeah. Cool. Um, we have another question. Um, Kay is saying, should you completely change all cat furniture and toys in between cats? For example, when something happens to my current rescue boy and he does go over the bridge, should I totally replace everything before bringing new cat or cats into the house? It's a good question. Um, I'd have to see the stuff, but I think, um, let's weigh it. Okay, so like, let's look at the negatives. The negatives would be that if you, okay, let me preface it first. You do the best you can at cleaning this stuff. How do you clean a cat tree? How do you clean something that's made of material? Um, that's gonna have a lot of hair on it. It's gonna be a lot of cat hair. When we worked in, uh, when I worked in the animal shelter, what we would do is spray the entire cat tree and surface that had hair on it, get it real wet. And then we would comb it like with a brush, we'd brush off all that wet hair. We use a, a rubber glove and we would get it all off. We call it gloving the, uh, the cat furniture. So, you know, you clean it the best you can, but the negative side of it is that some cats are cat reactive. So if you have, you see it in shelters a lot, you know, a new cat comes to a shelter and they're just like, they're livid by the fact that they can smell or see other cats. So if you brought that cat home to your house and there's it smells of other cats on that furniture, it's not going to make them feel like they have ownership over the space right away. So my advice would be to probably put that stuff away and try new stuff, um, depending on, on what we know about that animal, you know, uh, fosters and rescues tend to come and go. So people aren't going to buy, new furniture every single time they do that. So you got to, you know, clean it the best you can with an enzyme cleaner or something that removes smells and re and pheromone residues um, and, and, and watch for that reactivity. So, it, I mean, it depends on the condition of the furniture and also the, yeah. cat, the, the cat that you're bringing in. And I've seen some pretty spent cat trees on the cut. You know, people throw them out on the curb after a while. You just see that they're like, there's like, big ape, gaping holes in them and isn't the cat tree i would keep for a new cat but if you have one that's easily cleaned like this one here like it's my cat tree it's mostly wood right so there isn't actually a lot of material except for this base right here that i could i could clean that if i wanted to or shampoo it so like the kind of tree you have matters that, that's a cleanable cat tree i could actually i could use that with any cat i wanted but if you're using carpet or using something like sisal and that kind of stuff then you probably want to work on at least like letting it soak for a little bit, patting it dry, letting it sit in the sun, whatever you can do to refresh it enough. But cats tend to want to scratch things that are already scratched because there's, you know, they're, they, they want to make it theirs too, or they want to add to the group scent. So on one hand, you have something that's really, really uh, attractive to be, to be scratched because it already is scratched versus something you put in that's brand new that they might be like, smell sterile why would i scratch it you know what i mean so it really depends on the cat but the motivation to scratch it i don't think a cat would not scratch something that is already scratched like they but they might walk up to it smell it and go who's this cat and then stay really really agitated and then you know feel like they don't own their space so i've seen both sides and this is assuming that the cat who passed away didn't have some kind of like infectious illness or something right because in that case you would just want to get all new stuff yeah yeah i mean it's it's totally conditional but if it's a perfect situation with cats are healthy and behaviorally they're nice and friendly and they're not reactive then you might be able to get away with it just by cleaning it really well all right thank you for your question Kay. thank you for your answer daniel um there was one other question up here and then i think we'll probably start wrapping it up soon uh where did it go aha so it's on the topic that we were just discussing. So Susan asked, is there an ideal cat age for someone who is new to having cats at home? Would a younger cat who is maybe more flexible be a better fit? 
So back to the topic of newbies. An ideal cat age for someone who is new to having cats. Um, yeah, that is that is up for debate. I think um, my instincts say to get the cat who's already established, you know, like the cat who's already a young adult. Um, the, the human being wants to get a cat usually that they're going to get the longest lifespan from, right? So they tend to, when they're new to get a kitten, and that, I think that's fine because kittens are highly adaptable. They're easy uh, because they're, they're, the behaviors that they develop when they're older aren't quite there yet. So on one hand, you have fun, ex exciting experience of bonding and creating an, a cat with you. You can mold their experiences. You can expose a kitten to whatever you want them to do as an adult. If you want to pick up your cat, well, start picking up your kitten, but do it nice and gentle, and you work your way to that tolerance. So on one hand, a, a young kitten is great for a, a new person because you, there's a learning curve, but you, will, you have the time to kind of go through the process together. But an older cat is going to you get what you get. You're getting a cat who may just be a couch potato and sleep all day, uh, or you're going to get one who's high energy. And this is what the important part is, like, who are you as the new cat guardian? What is it that you want? What are you ready for? You don't want the cat to be vocal. You don't want the cat to be up at night playing. You, then that you want that couch potato cat, right? But if you're like, no, I'm up for it. All I want to do is play with cats. And you're going to find a young adult that's or kitten that's really, really, really active. So when I was working for the San Francisco SPCA as an adoption counselor and matchmaking people, um, those are the questions we would ask. You know, we would have a dossier of information about a cat that's spend, spent some time with us. And then we would try our best to take that information and then boil it down and see who is this person? What are they looking for? What are your expectations? And then work through them, whether they're realistic or not. And that's, that's what we do at Treehouse too, our adoption counselors. We have the open adoption process where it's more about making the perfect match between the person and their cat and the lifestyle and making sure that it's a good fit as opposed to yeah. just asking like, you know, the regular questions of do you yeah. have this, that. Are you allowed to have cats? Right. <laughs> yeah. We, we, uh, we try to trust our adopters and just make sure that it's a good fit yeah. between them and the animals so that both of them are happy. Conversation um, based matchmaking is always way better than fill out this form. I'm going to ask you for your ID now. And, you know, it seems to be working well for us. Um, I mean, I think, I don't remember when tree has switched to that. I think, I mean, it's at least been a year, if not a little bit more to switch to the conversation based, but um, yeah. you know, we've had some good, we've had good results with it, I think, because it's, it's making some good matches and, and yeah. also people feel less, stressed about coming into adopt when they yeah, know it's going to yeah. be about a good match as opposed to about, you know, that's a good point. Yeah. I talk to volunteers that are local animal control and I tell them about the fact that they're frontline customer service. And when a person walks into an animal shelter, whether you know it or not, they feel like they're going to be judged. They feel like they, they have to be uh, interviewed for this animal. And, you know, you're there as a volunteer getting, getting information that's useful for that person at the desk. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's delicate. You want to be, it's hard to not be judgmental. We're humans. We have our, we're protective of these cats. We want them to go to the right home, but the conversations we have and that, uh, connection we make with the person is how we make a forever home. It's mm -hmm. a good point. Yeah. Well, if nobody has any other questions, I think we've just about reached our time limit here with you. Daniel, if anybody wants to get in contact with you, they can find you where? You can find me at gocatgosf.com or at gocatgosf on all social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And just because you're in San Francisco doesn't mean you can't be in someone's living room like you are right now. Good point. <laughs> Yes. If you uh, would like to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, you can go to gocatgosf.com. You can book me easily. Uh, we do Skype, FaceTime, Zoom, all that good stuff. And we'll solve your issue. Cat problem solved right here. He's, he's got the got the in on cat probes. And if anybody, of course, always, uh, you know, anybody who has a treehouse cat, we are happy to help you guys. If anybody wants to adopt, we still do have a few cats for adoption right now. 
Um, intake is a little bit slower right now. We're still working through some things, but um, you can see our adoptable cats at treehouseanimals.org. And if anybody needs us, you can always call us. We are still answering the phones, 773-262-4000. Um, Thank you, Daniel. It was so good to see you again. I My think pleasure. we'll probably have you back again because we're, we still got a lot of questions to answer cool. and um, yeah. we're, we're still in our houses. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. So next Friday, it's a date. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Daniel. And thanks right. to everybody for watching. Have a great day. Okay.